Uh, who here doesn't like a story? All right. Go with the story. Just listen. It's not a perfect story. <coughs> kind of a fun story. Might make you think a little bit. But once upon a time, in a town called Terrain, the townspeople used to speak of three identical triplet brothers. Now these brothers, most of us would probably consider absolute overachievers. The brothers, Frank, Josh, and Haley, were all doctor, lawyer, scientist, philanthropist, and teacher. Can you imagine how many degrees, like, you have, that's a lot of letters behind a name. Now, of the brothers, and all of them having the same equal looks, appearance, and knowledge, there are still some misunderstandings of some of them. Like Haley. Haley was often, like, the most misunderstood, probably first because of the name, but then there's also the problem that no one had actually ever seen Haley. See, Haley would teach, he would speak and teach, but no one ever saw him. It was as if the voice would just kind of come out of the bushes. And when people were helped and then they would look around to see where that help came from, no one was there. And so they always would accredit that help to Haley, the brother. Even when he gave legal advice, no one quite understood where Haley was. Now, Frank and Josh, see, they received a lot more attention than Haley. But the problem was, the brother, Frank, no one had actually ever seen Frank either. Now, Frank was an author, though. That was the one difference between them all. Frank was an author. Frank wrote a whole lot of books books that would teach, teach about law and science, would teach about helping others, you know, philanthropy. See, Frank wrote these books, and some people had really, they had read these books, and it helped some, and many people began to understand these books a little bit, and some just rejected the books. They're like, this is a bunch of bunk. I don't, I've never even seen this author. But nonetheless people had at least heard about Frank's books. And then there was Josh. See, Josh was the brother that everyone could actually see. Josh was there helping people. Josh was there teaching people. Josh was there just teaching. And one day, someone from the town just came up to Josh. And he had a problem with Josh, see, because when Josh would teach, Josh was usually always teaching out of Frank's books. And they're like, are you trying to take credit for Frank's writings? Nope, just trying to help people understand it. Frank's kind of, he's kind of up there. I think you're trying to take credit for his books. And by the way, if you guys are identical triplet brothers, how come we've never seen Frank and Haley around here anymore? In fact, we've never seen Frank and Haley. Do they even exist? How come we can't see you guys together? Who are you? There's some people that thought that maybe Josh is kind of dealing with some type of personality disorder. And he just responded with, who am I? See, that's the series that we're in. Who am I? Jesus asked this of his disciples. Who am I? Matthew 16. He says, who do people say that I am? Well, some say that you're John the Baptist, and some say that you're Elijah, and some say that you're... You're Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. But who do you say that I am? In other words, disciples. Who am I? And Peter, 
impulsive Peter speaks up boldly and says, well, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. He says, blessed are you, Peter, because this wasn't revealed to you by man, by flesh and blood, but it was revealed to you by the heavenly Father. Blessed are you who recognized. Who am I? If Jesus was standing here right now asking, who am I? Could you answer him? Would you know what to say? See, Peter kind of gave two distinctives. You're the Messiah, the Savior, and the Son of the living God. Two distinctives about who Jesus is, was. See, but that's the problem. There are a lot of people who, they get caught up in some of these distinctives and they, they just don't fully understand. See, today, if we ask, people might understand this. They might understand Jesus, Savior, Jesus, Son of God. But what I want to do is take you back to a time where there are people who still didn't understand, even when Jesus was speaking. So if you would, turn with me to John chapter 10. If you have your Bibles, I can't tell you what page it's on. If you don't have your Bible, at least here in person, you can grab the Bible in the seat in front of you. You can turn to page 870. That's the Worship Center Bible. And we're going to start in verse 22. By the way, if you don't have a Bible, if you're here in person and you don't have a Bible, grab the Worship Center Bible. It's a gift from us to you to make sure that you have God's word so that you can begin maybe to understand who Jesus is. All right? So, verse 22, chapter 10 of the book of John. Then the festival of dedication at Jerusalem, or excuse me, then came the festival of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter. And Jesus was in the temple, uh, the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews who were gathered around him, saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. In other words, like, Jesus, you know, who are you? Like, you, you say that you're this person. Just, just tell us, clear cut. Let us know beyond a shadow of a doubt. Just say it. Who are you? Right? Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me, but you do not believe, because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. Okay, now stop right there for a second. No one can snatch them out of my hand. Jesus, we're talking about sheep. No one will snatch them out of my father's hand. In this culture, sheep were owned by one, not by two. No one will snatch them out of my father's hand. No one will snatch them out of my hand. See, we have this problem where people were not already understanding who Jesus was. And what does he say after this? I and the Father are one. Jesus, Father, one. I and the Father are one. Again, his Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? We are not stoning you for any good work, they replied, but for blasphemy, because a mere man, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. See, the Jews, the Jewish people, they had this problem. They said, 
you're blasphemous. Jesus, you're speaking this truth as it is concerning to God. This is why we want to put you to death. It's against our law to be able to do such a thing, to be able to claim such a thing. And so they wanted to put him to death. Why? Because they simply misunderstood. And I think, honestly, sometimes the simplest of things, the most distinctives about God, are still misunderstood even today. I can tell you, standing right here, of a conversation that I had in this worship center, in this sanctuary. I'm not going to look at the spot. The person's not here, by the way. But I can look right at the spot and see the seats that I sat in and the person sat in. And they had been coming for a while. And they said, you know what? I don't think I can come here anymore. And I'm like, why? What's going on? Like you'd been coming for a while and you seemed like you're kind of growing a little bit. Oh yeah, well, you know, I, I like the music and that's good. And I'm like, okay, what else? Well, I like the people and that's good. And okay, what else? Uh, the messages have been good. Okay, so what's, what's wrong then? Well, when you pray, I'm like, oh, then I pray too long? I don't know. He said, no, 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 no. See, you pray, but like, there's times in your prayer where you say, like, Jesus is God. Like, that doesn't make sense to me. Like, Jesus isn't God. And I'm like, okay, oh, okay, hang on. And, and so, you know what? I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but I promise you, I'm not crazy. This really can happen, and I, I bet you there's a couple hands that could go up. Like, I started praying as I was talking at the same time. Like, it's possible, totally in conversation, to be praying and talking, and I was doing it. I'm like, okay, God. Help me show him truth. So I said, well, who's God? He's like, well, you know, God. He's the one who created everything. And I'm like, okay, okay, good. Have you read the book of Genesis? Oh, yeah, 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 I've read, I've read that. Now, I don't really believe all of it. Like, I know God created, but I don't believe what it says. And I'm like, oh, boy, here we go. I'm like, here's the challenge. Like, he wants to believe only what he wants to believe, and so his heart's already kind of closed off. So, like, now my prayer inside gets a little more frantic and a little different going, okay, God, to soften his heart, help his heart to be receiving of truth. God, help his unbelief. Help his mind to understand even just a little bit more. Just get him even just a little bit closer. I said, okay, so you've read Genesis, but you don't really believe it. I'm like, okay, let's, let's skip over this because you kind of have this, this issue with Jesus and God. And I'm like, okay, have you read any of the, like, the synoptic gospels? Have you read like Matthew, Mark, Luke? Have you read any of, any of those? And he's like, oh, yeah, parts of it. And I'm like, okay, have you ever read the book of John? Like, here's the deal. You read the first chapter of John and you're going to see Jesus is God. He's like, no, I've not really read that. I'm like, okay, let's, let's open it up. So that's what I'd like you guys to do. Because fundamentally, fun, fun, I can't even say it, I'm tired. Fundamentally, we have to understand, and some of you might go, well, no doll, Pastor Jesus is God. We have to understand that, and we have to own it, and we have to know it. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, and so if you already know this, forgive me, but please pay attention. Why? Because hopefully, prayerfully, you are discipling someone who might have some of those very same questions that I had to try and answer, and I could only point them to Scripture. I could only point them to God, and in my mind, I'm just praying, God, reveal yourself. Help him to experience you. Because as, as we've already talked about in this message series, the only thing that man can do is point someone to God and God has to reveal himself and that person has to experience God for them to be able to understand, to be able to answer, who am I? If Jesus were right here asking that question. And so maybe, maybe you'll just learn a little something. 
maybe you'll learn how to phrase something. Not that I'm going to do it perfectly because I am just a man as well. But I want to walk you through this so that maybe we can own this fundamental principle of who Jesus is. So John chapter 1. For those that are following in the Worship Center Bible, it's page 860. And we're going to break down the first verse in three parts. And then we're going to skip down to another verse. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word. The Word was with God. The Word, God. And the Word was God. Wait a minute. The Word, God, and the Word was God. Remember, we've already done this today. One hand here, one hand here, and they come together. The Word was God. See, John, you have to understand with John, he's writing to two different audiences here. That's the, that's the cool part about the letter of John. See, the, the letters that get written are usually to a specific person or a specific audience. And John is kind of writing to a very broad spectrum here. He's writing to Jewish people. He's writing to Gentile people. He's writing to like anybody who wants to read this letter. And John is doing something here at the very beginning. And he's starting to just turn people's up on their heads. Because this is like, whoa, wait a minute. Now, specifically, this is starting to turn the Jewish people on their heads. Now comes the time where it takes Gentile people, those that understood Greek, Greek philosophy, Greek religion with the, the multiple gods, and he turns them on their heads. Jump down to verse 14. Verse 14 says this. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Down here on earth. See, that was the challenge. We see in John 1, 1 that like we kind of have these two separate type things, like the Word and God, and they're separate, but then he like brings them together, and they're the same. See, Jewish people thought that that would just be blasphemous as John finished and said the Word was God. No, 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 the Word, logos, that's the, that's the word in the, in the original language. We would oftentimes say logos. It's not as logos, or I, might, I don't even have the accent perfect. Okay? That's what any time you see in the, the original language when it talks about the word, it's logos. And the Jewish people would understand the word, logos, a little bit differently. See, the Jewish people would understand logos, the word, as like the agent of creation, Right? Creation. Let's go back to Genesis. In the beginning, God created the first five words of the Bible. In the beginning, God created. In the beginning. Wait a minute. John said that too. In the, in the beginning, right? See the correlation there? So John is already turning the Jewish people on their head because he's taking them right back to the very first words in their Bible, in their scriptures, in their scroll that they had. And he's saying something about the word and God, in the beginning, God created. The Word was the agent of creation to the Jewish people. See, but they didn't have just the book of Genesis. They also had the Psalms. And Psalm 33, 6 says, By the word of the Lord, the he uh, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. By the breath, the words that are coming out of his mouth created the starry heavens and everything else. The word God created. There's even a letter that was written to the Hebrews, to the Jewish people specifically. 
Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. That was a letter that was specifically written to the Jewish people that were already struggling with, well, who is God? Who is Jesus? Like, how does this all work together? And the letter to the Hebrews was like, let's clarify some stuff. Let's help you understand this very thing. And so that was part of the problem that the Jewish people would have is they're like, no, 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 God, his word, his breath, everything that comes out of his mouth, that's the agent of creation. But logos meant a little bit more, the word. It also meant that it was the source of the message to the people. It was only words, like literal words. And Hosea 4.1 says, hear the word of the Lord, you Israelites. In other words, every time one of the prophets from back in the day spoke, that was God's word to them. Not the word like a physical something, but just his word, his breath, his thought that would then vocalize to the people. And so the Jewish people are still struggling with this whole concept of the word being capital W, the word. We capitalize what? Pronouns. We capitalize names of people. And so here John has capitalized the W on word. Probably the L on Logos. So they're really struggling here, trying to figure this out. See, the Jewish people also understood the word as the standard of the law, which is holiness. Psalm 119, see, this is what they would have also. They would have had Hosea, the prophet. They would have had the Psalm 119. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. In other words, I've hidden your your word, your law, everything that, God, you say to me that, that is supposed to be good for me, to everything that you say you should not do or you should do, I hide that in my heart, and that comes only from your thought, which then you have vocalized your words, God, that is hidden in my heart, the word. See, but the Jewish people were really struggling here because whoever this word is, capital W, here, is now being called God. And you can't blaspheme the name of the Lord, is what they're saying. And so it kind of stops them in their tracks. Now the Gentiles, the Gentiles would be stopped when he got, when they got down to verse 14, the word became flesh. It was just an unthinkable concept to the Gentiles, to anyone who understood Greek philosophy and understood Greek religion, because the Greeks were, they're polytheistic. They had all sorts of gods, Zeus and Aphrodite, and I, there's many, many gods. See, but the gods were not personal. They weren't personable. They didn't care about the people. That was their view of all those gods. They didn't care at all about the people. They're almost like little tiny ants with the, with, the, with the elementary kid who's using the magnifying glass to focus the sun and kind of burn them and toy with them and play with them. And that was their view of gods and people and the relationship between. See, they were far off all the time, just kind of toying with us, and when things went bad, they're like, oh, we must have done something bad. We got to do something to please them so that they, they get happy and joyful again. And then they, maybe they'll be nice to us again. And, and so to say that the word became flesh means that a God came down to be personal, to actually interact with man. That's never happened before. So that's going to stir the Gentiles up as well. This is a brand new teaching then for all. See, but we understand that the world was already stirred up at this point. Why? Because Jesus was there. Jesus was in the world. See, the Jews would have already known this if they really kind of paid attention a little bit to Scripture, the Scriptures that they should know. I mean, they understood that Jesus stirred the world up when he was born, something that was foretold a long time ago and was written about in the book of Isaiah. Again, 
the prophet who spoke the words to them from God. Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. See, the Jewish people, they should have paid a whole lot of attention to names because in their culture, name was everything. Like, when you had a name, you bore that name and there was a purpose for that name. And this, this pur- the purpose for this name, Emmanuel, See, in Matthew 1, we got the benefit of Matthew 1. It says, Emmanuel, which means God with us. In other words, the word of God told them that the word was going to come down and be with them and be very personal to them so God would be with us, would be human, would care about man to live with man, to interact with man, to love on man, to teach man. But the Jewish people, they kind of missed it. And they're still trying to keep everything separate. The word and God, no, separate. Man, if they had just turned a couple more chapters like I did, got to verse 6 of chapter 9, they would have read something like this, something that many of you might even be able to recite from memory because we read it so often at Christmas time. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. Listen to this. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Break that down really slowly. And he, singular, not plural, singular, and he will be called wonderful, wonderful counselor. Who's the counselor? The Holy Spirit. Mighty God. Everlasting Father. Prince of Peace. Who's a prince? A son of a king. The son of God. If you really break that down, see, we see what truly is happening. He, singular, is all these distinctives. He is the Holy Spirit. God is the Holy Spirit. God is also the everlasting Father, the heavenly Father, God the Father. Also, God the Son. And wrapped in the middle of that text, wonderful counselor, mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. In the middle of it, as best you can when there's three, is the name Mighty God with three distinctives surrounding him. Holy Spirit, Son, and Father. Jesus is God. That's what happens when we break it down. But you know what? People still misunderstand And so I hope you're still tracking with me. Bear with me here. If you're doubting this, you're in good company. See, there is this guy, Thomas. Thomas kind of struggled with doubt a little bit. See, Thomas, and and again, in John, uh, John chapter 20, so the same book. John tries so hard, this letter that John writes tries so hard to explain it to people over and over again, who he really is, that he records the words of Thomas. See, Thomas struggled like, oh, Jesus is dead. What are we going to do? No, 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 Thomas, Thomas, we've seen him. He is alive. We have seen him. We've seen the holes in his hands. He's like, no, I doubt it. I don't think so. And Jesus is there and says, Thomas, put your hand in the hole. See that it is real. And you know what Thomas says? My Lord and my God. Two distinctives of, as he's staring in the face of Jesus Christ himself, he gives two distinctives. My Lord and my God. And Jesus doesn't correct them. That says a lot right there. Jesus doesn't go, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Like, I'm just Jesus. I'm not Lord and God. I'm just Jesus. No, no, he doesn't correct them because he realizes Thomas is right. 
Just like Peter finally had it right and it could only be revealed by the Heavenly Father, it was revealed to Thomas. You're Jesus. You're my God. The same. Jesus is God. Paul. Paul writes a letter to Titus. Titus chapter 2. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope. Now listen, this is the important part. The appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself. I'm just going to stop right there. Great God. Savior, singular, Jesus Christ, singular, gave himself. Jesus is God. Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1, to those, through who righteous, uh, to those through righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, have received a faith as precious as ours. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, his divine power. Singular again, his. Do you see where I'm going with this? Here's the problem. You can't separate. You cannot separate God and Jesus. They, they are not separate. They are one in the same. And if you separate, then they're incomplete. And if they're incomplete, then we are not worshiping a complete and glorious God. They are one in the same. It's an impossibility to separate them. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit is impossible to separate. They're just distinctives of who our God is, which is why God has so many names like we sang about this morning. But because he's just, Fully, he is he's just complete in every single way. So Jesus is God. That's how, that's how you would answer. If Jesus was here and he goes, well, who am I? Jesus, you're God. But if that's who he is, then who are you? See, that's this whole series. We learn a little bit about, about God. We learn a little bit about, about Jesus. And then we get to go, well, who am I then? If I am called this new creation, if I am this new being in Christ, you have this new identity, as the Bible says, you have a new identity, you are a new creation in Christ, then who am I now? Listen to this list. I want you to understand this list that I'm about to receive, and this is an incomplete list, but this is just a sampling. If you understand the word of God, if you understand your Bible, if you read scripture, this is just a short list of who you are in Christ Jesus. And so I want you to, to hear this list. If you're keeping notes, hey, go back and hit rewind on YouTube later. But I want you to boldly say this about yourself when someone goes, well, who are you then? You can say, I am blessed. I am hopeful. I am strong. I am loved. I am saved. I am adopted. I am accepted. I am protected. I am entrusted. I am complete. I am victorious. I am free of condemnation. I am his image bearer. I am his workmanship. I am a friend of God. I am a co-heir with Christ. I am an ambassador for Christ. I am receiving an inheritance. I am a servant of Christ. I am a name bearer. I am a son or daughter of the Most High. I am a Christian. I am a child of God. I am a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, who is God, who died for me. Praise God, amen, hallelujah, let's go home. That's who you are in Christ and more. And so when you are sitting, just like I was, maybe it's not in this room, maybe it wasn't in that awkward position because they're in the row behind me and I'm kind of turned around in the seat and breaking my back trying to explain it to them. Maybe you'll remember just a little something Maybe you'll remember just that foundational principle that Jesus is God. You can say it now with confidence because you've been pointed to Scripture. Reread it. Every reference I gave and more, 
Read it. Own it. Proudly proclaim it. Jesus is God. And you, you then are a child of God. And you know what the best part is? There's one that I didn't say. You're beautiful. You are beautiful because you were created perfectly in his image, even in all your brokenness. We're all broken in some way. But guess what? Most of that's just the lies of the world because we listen to the world more than we listen to God sometimes in our life. So stop believing the world and start believing what I just told you. You are beautiful. Jesus is God. And if you believe in him, if you confess with your mouth that he is Lord, you believe in your heart that he was raised from the dead, then you can go through that list and say, that's me. I'm that new creation. Blessed, loved, victorious, adopted, a co-heir. You can say it all proudly because he walked out of a grave. Worship team's gonna come back up. I'm gonna pray. And then we're gonna sing. We're gonna sing because he's worthy. We're gonna sing because we love to. We're gonna, be, we're gonna sing because he's God and he deserves all glory. Let's pray.